A nucleus of about 120 men is being left behind as a peg on which to hang a new battalion if we should be completely chewed up. I imagined the married men with the largest families would be on the nucleus, but not a bit of it. Dawn reveals to us a sight which no one could visualise without having actually seen it. We can stand up and see the round of the horizon. It's like being on the sea, but our sea is a sea of mud. There is not a blade of grass nor a spot of colour anywhere. In the middle distance there's something which, by exaggeration, might be called a hill. We imagine that this must be the celebrated Passchendaele Ridge. On occasions, when things were not going too well, I was always a man of few words. It was not so with Rumbold. Ah, uh, would you consider that we are under fire? It was his first time in action. He wanted to write home, tell his mother that he'd been under fire. At the time, I didn't understand the psychology which had prompted the question. Since everything around us seemed to be going up in the air and descending again in the form of stones, showers of liquid mud, accompanied by the noises of whining nose caps, the mosquito-like hum of roving splinters, the question to me seemed to be utterly uncalled for and in very bad taste. You stick your bloody fool's head up and you'll bloody well soon see, I said. Rumbold subsided quite satisfied. He was under fire. We'd already seen what had happened to the first ripple of men. They had all made for the hill, that spot of higher, drier ground. The Germans had retired over it, and they knew exactly what must happen. The sky rained shells upon it. Shrapnel was bursting, not much more than face high. The liquid mud from ground shells was going up in clouds and coming down in rain. The first ripple was blotted out. The dead and the wounded were piled on each other's backs. The second wave, coming up behind, were compelled to cluster like a flock of sheep. They were knocked down in their tracks. They lay in heaving mounds. The wounded tried to mark their places to be found by stretcher bearers, sticking their bayonets into the ground, leaving their rifles upright with the butts pointing at the sky. There was a forest of rifles. They were quickly uprooted by further shell bursts or knocked down by bullets like so many skittles. Nothing had stood up and continued to live on the space of ground between ourselves and the pillbox a hundred and fifty yards away. I saw a stretcher bearer, his face a mask of blood, bending over a living corpse. He shouted to someone, beckoned, and on the instant he crumpled, fell. He went to meet his god. To do the enemy justice, I don't suppose for one moment that he was recognised as a stretcher bearer. Another man, obviously off his head, he wandered around aimlessly for perhaps ninety seconds. Then his tin hat was tossed into the air like a spun coin. Down he went. You could always tell when the man was shot dead. A wounded man, he always tried to break his fall. A dead man fell forward, his balance tending in that direction, bending simultaneously at the knees, waist, neck and ankles. Several of our men, most of whom had first been wounded, were drowned in the mud, drowned in the water. One very religious lad with pale blue watery eyes, he died the most appalling death. He was shot, shot through his lower gut, tumbled into the water of a deep shell hole and slowly drowned by inches. The coldness of the water added further torture to his wound. Our chaplain, who chose to go over the top with us, he was killed trying to save the lad, trying to haul him out. After the attack, there were only 18 left in our company. Our quartermaster, whom I had always found rather military, met us. He carried my rifle for me. 
You've had a hell of a time, he said with a catch in his voice. Pretty bad, I agreed. They'd rationed for about five times the number of men that actually returned. So, for a change, I got enough to eat. The quartermaster, he gave me three quarters of a mess tin full of rum. Neat. Proof spirit and that. <laughs> it would have killed a man who didn't really need it. But I drank it. I slept like a little child for six hours. <laughs>